Welcome to our Gallery of Greats, where you can discover the genius, the vision, the beauty, and the passion behind some of the world's greatest works. These are the people who have added to their own special work in progress. England. Perhaps no one person so embodied the spirit of a nation as Winston Churchill. He inspired a bravery and stoicism in the ordinary British people. The bulldog facing down the snarling hounds of Hitler's war. Astute and observant, he recognised danger and barked out vivid words of warning. From Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. Churchill famously offered Britain his blood, toil, tears and sweat, and gave much more. The collapsing house of cards that was Europe in the Second World War survived because of Churchill's Britain, a rock-solid foundation. Half American himself, he formed a close relationship with President Franklin Roosevelt, bringing the US in as a crucial partner in the Allied campaign. Churchill had a long and distinguished military and political career. In the closing stages of the war, he was aged 70 and yet handled his monumental task with enthusiasm and boundless energy. During the course of the war, he travelled over 100,000 miles, encouraging troops, meeting other world leaders and planning operations. He was a man who once said, um, you know, history will judge me and I'll write the history. So he was a man who had an eye for history himself who cared for history. As Winston Churchill said earlier, Winston Churchill Jr., as it were, um, history is, is, you've got to know where you're coming from to know where you're going to. That was, was almost Churchill's motto. British people loved their Winnie, with his brandy, cigars and top hats, and his wise, inspiring words. As he himself said, never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. From the day she was born, Elizabeth Alexandra Mary Windsor was destined to shape history. In 1936, her father unexpectedly became king. The ten-year-old child suddenly had to prepare to be queen and before long took on royal duties. Despite her status, she insisted on doing her bit during the war, becoming a military driver and mechanic. At 21, she married Prince Philip with whom she'd fallen in love when she was just 13. She was overseas on a royal tour when she learned of her father's death. At 25, she was queen of millions of people around the globe. With the tireless support of Philip, Elizabeth combined her royal commitments with a young family, Charles followed by Anne, and then after she became queen, Andrew and Edward. Like her father, she prepared her own children for royal duties, particularly Charles, heir apparent. Elizabeth's realm covered not just the United Kingdom, but several other countries, and she took seriously her role as Queen and as head of the Commonwealth. She travelled thousands of miles, meeting people in all parts of the Commonwealth, in many areas the first royal leader to do so. She made herself accessible to the people, going on walkabouts and involving herself in local customs and traditions. She accepted with good grace the changing nature of politics and the drift away from empire to republics. She has been an outstanding ambassador, showing a genuine concern for the human condition. Now well into her 80s, she remains remarkably youthful and alert. Still sharing herself with the world, and showing the same interest in people and cultures that she always has. She shows compassion and understanding to the poor, sick or uneducated, respecting the simple dignity that lies within. Elizabeth II always was, and still remains, a queen not just of the people, but for them. It's interesting that two of the most powerful women in recent history lived at the same time in the same relatively small patch of land, England. 
One had royal ancestry stretching back through history, the other was a grocer's daughter. Margaret Thatcher emerged during the 1950s and steadily worked her way up the slippery slope of British politics. It took her almost a decade to win a seat in Parliament, but she was persistent, a trait that would see her move from the back benches to the front, becoming a junior minister, leader of the opposition, and finally prime minister by the end of the 70s. Her conservative government confronted a Britain in decline, economically, diplomatically and socially. She went into battle, taking on the unions, reshaping taxation, selling off state assets and slashing expenditure. Her efforts polarised opinion as she reined in inflation while plunging millions into unemployment and hardship. She dragged the nation out of the wings and back into the international spotlight, forging a good friendship with fellow Conservative Ronald Reagan. Both Thatcher and Reagan were deeply distrustful of the Soviets, who famously described Britain's leader as the Iron Lady, a name that stuck for good reason. This steely determination of hers saw her face off against the Soviet Union during the Cold War, controversially allowing the United States to station nuclear missiles in England. Equally, she steamrolled through other episodes, shrugging off an assassination attempt by the provisional IRA. She wrested back the Falkland Islands from Argentina. Both events rallied opinion in her favour, drawing support even from those who called her Attila the Hen. When elected in 1979, Margaret Thatcher was Britain's first female Prime Minister. When her term ended, 11 and a half years later, she had become Britain's longest serving Prime Minister in the 20th century. He's the master of silly walks and dummy spits. He's a pompous toff, an eccentric hotelier, and one of the funniest men alive. John Cleese was already a successful writer and comedian when he teamed up with Graham Chapman, Eric Idle, Terry Gilliam, Terry Jones, and Michael Palin. This was the crazy, quirky, genius collective that created Monty Python's Flying Circus. Cleese's Ministry of Silly Walks and the dead Norwegian Blue Parrot are classic comedy sketches. With first wife Connie Booth, he created the enduring comedy classic Faulty Towers. His Basil Faulty is one of the funniest characters ever seen. Perhaps even more hilarious is the fact that he was based on a real person, the owner of a hotel in Torquay where the Python stayed. Most of the Pythons were driven out by the raging owner who couldn't stand guests, but Cleese and Booth stayed on, absorbing the mayhem. Only 12 episodes were ever made. After more than three decades, the show is still bellyache funny, as Basil schemes, fumes, and inevitably goes into meltdown. What I was really pleased about was that the shows really totally stand up. They haven't started to age yet, and they still look skillful. And I think the main reason was that Connie and I used to spend six weeks writing each episode. There was so much material in those episodes that there's a lot there. And that's why I think people can, can watch it over and over again. John Cleese discovered the power of humour at an early age. Unusually tall, he was already a six-footer by the age of 12. He quickly discovered that humour could deflect teasing or aggression. He's used it ever since, writing and performing in series and hit movies like A Fish Called Wanda. With recent roles in Shrek the Third and the Harry Potter films, another generation is discovering his comic genius. As John Cleese would say, and now for something completely different. David Attenborough really is an extraordinary human being. He is absolutely passionate about natural history and has been since a very young child. In a lifetime of discovery, he has amassed an encyclopedic knowledge of the natural world and has a boundless enthusiasm in sharing this with others. His father was principal of the University of Leicester and he grew up on campus. 
He was the middle of three brothers, the eldest being Richard, the renowned film director. His parents also adopted two girls, Jewish refugees during World War II. By the age of seven, he was already seriously studying nature, collecting birds' eggs, fossils and stones. He met a young academic, later an esteemed archaeologist and anthropologist. She was so impressed with his collection, she sent him a box filled with fossils, dried seahorses and unusual artefacts. He knew now that he wanted to be a naturalist and began devouring scholarly works, dreaming of one day seeing these exotic plants and animals for himself. In the early 1950s, he joined the BBC to work in the new medium of television. We know him as a presenter and producer, but he also ran BBC Two, introducing innovative, groundbreaking programmes. Television was the perfect medium for him to show us our amazing planet. People are getting increasingly cut off now. They are not going to care to preserve the natural world unless they know something about it, unless they have an affection for it. Um, and, and television films can bring that wild world into their living room. People can see not only how wonderful and beautiful it is, but how important it is. He works tirelessly, driven by his passion. Even at the age of 83, he travelled to the Arctic and Antarctic in 2010, braving blizzards, hazardous ice cracks and temperatures of minus 40 degrees Celsius to make a series documenting our disappearing poles. It is little wonder that he is considered a living treasure and a truly great specimen of the humankind. There are some people who just seem destined to do certain things. Almost in their cradle, their career or purpose is mapped out and they inevitably pursue that as soon as they possibly can. Andrew Lloyd Webber would certainly fit in that category. From the age of three, he began his musical odyssey, one that would see him dominating West End and Broadway theatre and the most successful composer of his time. If you love musical theatre like I do, the one thing that you do do is write simply out of the joy of having the, the luxury, really, of knowing that your work's going to be produced and doing it. And, I mean, a lot of people don't have even the, the luxury of having their work produced. In 1965, he met lyricist Tim Rice, and the pair began a successful collaboration. Their first major success was Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, followed by Jesus Christ Superstar and then Evita, spawning several classic songs. Flying solo next, Andrew created iconic productions such as Cats, which ran for an incredible 21 years in London. He topped that with Phantom of the Opera, seen by 80 million people and grossing $3.3 billion, the highest grossing entertainment event worldwide. It became the longest running show ever on Broadway. Well, the theatre is just a wonderful place to be, isn't it? Everything is always a live performance every night. It's always special. And there's no night you go to the theatre where anything is ever going to be exactly the same as it was before or will be the day after. As an 11-year-old, Andrew created an elaborate scale model theatre, staging his own mini-productions. Today, his really useful group owns theatres in the West End and continues to dominate in the field of theatre production. The company also produces film versions and cast albums of his productions, distributes a theatre magazine, runs a ticketing operation and publishes other musical acts. The little boy's dream has become an amazing Technicolor reality. Northern Ireland has good reason to be proud of George Best. He was one of the greatest footballers in the world. As local fans said, Maradona good, Pele better, George Best. With his steamy good looks, long hair and innate style, he was dubbed the fifth Beatle, and female fans swooned just as much as if he really was. He even made an appearance on legendary music show Top of the Pops. He was the first football celebrity. Fans deluged him with a thousand letters each week. The media loved him and the crowds loved him. Everybody wanted George. At his peak, he was sheer magic. He had it all, speed, two-footedness, tactical smarts, and deadly accurate shooting. In 
In 1968 with Manchester, he won the European Cup and was European Footballer of the Year. With his celebrity status went the celebrity lifestyle. He bought into fashion boutiques, but with a keen sense of personal style, was his own best customer and ended up wearing much of his profits. He opened two nightclubs in Manchester and again was his own best customer. There were modelling assignments, publicity shoots and all the trappings of stardom. It was all too much and his drinking and womanising became a real problem. His football career entered an irreversible slide. So did his health. Alcohol-related problems ended his new career as a football commentator and he died at the age of 59. In the final stages, he said, When I'm gone, people will forget all the rubbish and all that will be remembered will be the football. That'll do for me. Guy Ritchie has achieved what his teachers would never have imagined. As a dyslexic teenager, he was also rebellious and troubled. He attended one of Britain's most respected schools for dyslexic students, but was expelled at 15. A stint at another school was short-lived. He was more interested in filmmaking than studying. Landing work as a runner, he eventually followed his chosen career. Despite his early reading and writing difficulties, he has established himself as a writer and director. His first movie, Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels, was a great success, winning him a Best Motion Picture Screenplay Award. He has now written and directed five feature films and directed 2009's Sherlock Holmes with Robert Downey Jr. and Jude Law. Writing is much harder than directing. Directing is a visceral experience, right? You've got people in front of you that you can boss about and they can boss you about and it's a much more interactive experience. Um, writing is rather a solitary experience and of course there's no immediate rewards, there's no immediate sugar to keep you stimulated so you know am I writing a good thing I don't know if I'm writing a good thing so you, the only person that you've got essentially for the vast majority of it is your own ability to reflect upon you know, what it is that you're creating. Um, and directing just isn't like that. Directing is, you, you, it doesn't take you long before you find out what you're doing, if there's, an, if there's a market for it or not. So writing solitary and directing isn't. By the way, I'm glad I write. You know, writing's rewarding in its own way. It's just not as conspicuously as rewarding as something like directing. Guy's personal life has given him plenty of publicity. In 2000, his son Rocco was born to Madonna and the couple married soon after. In 2006, they adopted a one-year-old boy in Malawi, Africa. The couple separated in 2008 and reached a quick settlement. Guy Ritchie is now a rich guy. Without question, Dame Judi Dench would have to be one of the greatest actresses of our time. Her rich and varied career spans an astonishing body of theatre work, classic television series and quality movies. It's been in her latter years that she has received general recognition. Although theatre-goers have loved her for years. She has been Oscar-nominated six times since she turned 60. Her eight minutes of screen time in Shakespeare in Love won her the Best Supporting Actress Oscar. Her acting pedigree is impeccable. She helped form the Royal Shakespeare Company and wowed audiences as Sally Bowles in the West End production of Cabaret, proving to be a gifted singer. On television, she has appeared in popular series and starred in classic British films of the 80s. It wasn't until the 90s, however, that she received widespread recognition. Her role as M in the James Bond films and performances in films including Chocolat, Mrs. Brown, Notes on a Scandal and Shakespeare in Love 
finally made her a household name. Terrific to have won. I'm completely overwhelmed to have won too. Because I, uh, I, 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 really, I really knew and actually know nothing about filming. I mean, I, you know, you just, as you go along, you pick it up from, from other actors. You watch them. It's like in the theatre, you know. If you watch, because the moment you think you, you think, oh, yes, well, I know how to do it. That's the moment that the man with a bucket of ice cold water comes around and chucks it in your face, and you find that that's the kind of thing that you can't, the challenge that you can't kind of meet. And so it's a constantly learning process. Though regarded so highly throughout the industry, she never rests on her laurels. Fortunately for us, Dame Judy is happy to keep learning for a while longer. Ranulph Fiennes is at that time of his life when most men are already retired and exercise is a wonder to the local shop. A former British Army officer, Ranulph is considered the world's greatest adventurer. He's travelled to both poles, discovered a lost city and, despite a fear of heights, climbed mountains. The first major feature, unfortunately, is called difficult, and I consider what we've done so far extremely difficult, uh, so I'm dreading what comes next. He dedicates his time to taking on challenges, raising money for charity. But the risks are very real. An extreme bout of frostbite at the North Pole cost him his fingertips, and he's been in life-threatening situations too many times to remember. On this excursion, he successfully took on the treacherous north face of the Eiger and in 2009 became the oldest British person to reach the summit of Mount Everest. In 2003, just four months after an almost fatal heart attack and a double bypass operation, he was back in form. The task to complete seven marathons in seven days on seven continents. Uh, it's good fun, really, isn't it? Yeah. Right. Uh, well, I mean, the idea was good fun. Yeah. Uh, and also, um, each continent has been given the opportunity of raising money for a charity of its choice. In the UK, um, it's the British Heart Foundation. In Singapore, it's the Singapore Heart Association. In Cairo, it's for world peace. Ranulf keeps dreaming up impossible tasks for himself and has already raised millions of dollars for charity. His superhuman feats have earned him worldwide recognition and an order of the British Empire. They've also earned him a rest, but somehow that doesn't seem likely just yet. <laughs> 